Hey, what's going on? I'm Dr. Chris. I'm a physical therapist. I'm in Naples, Florida. I'm the owner of Dynamic Physio. And I put together this presentation both for my clientele and also for any uh, new therapists I hire. I'm actually very passionate about uh, diabetes because I was born with hypoglycemia, which basically sets you up to become diabetic later in life if you're not careful. So I've always kept a tight eye on my blood sugar regulation, and I feel like this is important more now than ever for most Americans. So here's what we're going to go over today. I'm going to talk about the magnitude or just how big of a problem this is, which is huge. So with that, we'll go over the history and prevalence. I'm going to spend a lot of time with that because uh, understanding how we got here, I think, is vital to understanding nutritional guidelines and how maybe not all the guidelines are exactly right. We're going to go over some complications from diabetes and some orthopedic considerations. Then we'll talk about measurement, so recognizing clinical signs, some tests that we can do, and some other tests that can be ordered, and we'll go over some blood markers. And lastly, we'll talk about how to manage diabetes, uh, what to do in a, like a hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic event, <clears throat> and then diet and lifestyle recommendations to manage diabetes. So now we'll dive into the magnitude. So we'll start off with the history and something I like to call the perfect storm. So there's a few key players and events that occurred that led to uh, ultimately the formation of the diet heart hypothesis. That's sort of the current hypothesis. This is the um, basically the idea that LDL is bad and clogs the arteries. So uh, a lot of events occurred to lead to this, and we'll start going over that. So in 1955, President Eisenhower had a heart attack and left him basically bedbound for about six weeks. And a heart attack at this point was not common, not like it is today. So the country kind of had a big scare. So around this time, there was a physiologist by the name of Ansel Keys, and he noticed a trend of middle-aged businessmen having heart, heart attacks. And he came up with the theory that saturated fat is what clogs the arteries, so he set out to prove this. So Keyes proposed the diet heart hypothesis to uh, the World Health Organization and eventually the American Medical Association who adopted it. He then went on to do what's called the seven country study. Uh, this is a very famous study and it's, um, I want to say biased, but it, it's observational research first of all. So obser observational research or epidemiology has some issues. It's basically correlational uh, research. So you've probably heard the phrase correlation is not causation. Um, and that's true because you can pick like any two variables and put them against each other and you can find some sort of correlation. And there's, these are fun to kind of Google. Here's why I found the number of people who drown by falling into a pool correlates with the number of movies Nicolas Cage has been in. Or how about this one? Per capita cheese consumption correlates with the number of people who die by getting tangled in their own bed sheets. A kind of crazy one. But um, point being is that the seven country study was an observational uh, study. Uh, generally, when you're doing these types of things, and in nutrition science in particular, it's very hard to do research on, but you start off with that correlational research to see if you can find a signal. Then you have to go on and do like randomized controlled trials and other higher level uh, uh, research studies to basically figure out if your hypothesis is correct. So that's the problem number one with uh, the seven country study. Problem number two is what's called healthy user bias or unhealthy user bias. So that basically just means that if you are making conscious decisions about your health, say you went from a standard American diet and said, you know what, I want to get healthy, and then you decide to go vegan. Well, you're also gonna, that's like a keystone habit. You're also going to tend to do other things like move more, exercise, and uh, just make better decisions around your health. And the converse is true, which would be the unhealthy user bias. So if you're one that uh, kind of takes risks and chances and maybe ignore dietary guidelines and eat a lot of red meat and, and smoke cigarettes, you tend to get some unhealthy variables. So this kind of puts a lot of uh, variance into the signal and damages any kind of validity. But the third and probably biggest problem with the seven country study is that uh, he did do observation of 22 different countries and he only picked the seven countries that fit his hypothesis. So saturated fats took a hit from the seven country study and the work of Ansel Keys. And meanwhile, the, uh, on the other side of the coin, sugar, the big sugar corporations, um, were basically plotting some things. So they had the SRF, which is the Sugar Research Foundation, and that was headed by Henry Haas. And he said that 
if they could recapture the fat consumption of Americans and repurpose it as sugar consumption, they could increase their profits by over a third, which is very profitable. So then the SRF went on to basically bribe some researchers at Harvard. They paid them $50,000 to sponsor some research and had them say that basically saturated fats are blame and sugar does not cause any heart disease. This is all open access. You can find all this information on the Internet, and it will be in my references as well. Oh, I should mention that that uh, research was in the New England Journal of Medicine, and back then they didn't have the uh, conflict of interest disclosure. That wasn't a rule back then, so it was not clear who funded the research. So it was basically a double whammy. That's why I call it the perfect storm, like a rogue wave. Uh, on one half, on one side you got uh, researchers saying that sugar is not to blame, and the other side you have Ansel Keys saying that saturated fat is to blame. And fast forward, you have the fat-free craze that hit the 80s, and now, you know, diabetes is uh, insane in this country. And so diabetes is insulin resistance, basically the same thing. Uh, insulin has a crucial role in the body. All our cells have insulin receptors, and it has, you know, you're probably familiar with the idea that insulin pushes sugar from the bloodstream into uh, muscle and liver but has a lot of other roles. And one of the main roles it has is, is in an anabolic. It's, in a, it's a builder of things. So it does build fat cells. In fact, um, diabetics who regularly inject insulin develop these sort of pockets of fat right at the injection sites because of all the insulin. So that's the perfect storm. Um, so let's go over some numbers here. So type 2 diabetes prevalence. Um, well, first I wanted to say, uh, this is what I call the diet spectrum, right? So there are three macros. We've got proteins, fats, and carbs. Um, so everyone agrees that we need protein. There's no uh, nothing controversial about that. Um, but the controversy sits in, you know, is it carbs or fats that are making us fat and sick? So if you picture a spectrum, we'll say on the left side, so arbitrarily, uh, you've got a high-carb, low-fat diet. So that's going to be vegetarians, vegans, uh, you know, the whole plant-based movement is going to be in the high-carb, low-fat diet. And then the opposite side, on the right side, you got uh, high-fat, low-carb. So on the very extreme, you got carnivore. Then you've got, you know, paleo, Atkins. Um, those are all on that side of the spectrum. So you're, um, you're thinking around which macronutrient is the devil, <laughs> in a sense, Hint, neither one are, by the way, um, will determine which way you are veering on the spectrum. And let me clarify too, when I say carbs, I, I don't just mean breads and pastas, I mean glucose. So, um, you know, fruits and vegetables are high carb. And again, that's not necessarily bad. There's, there's not all carbs are equal, but that's, that's, that's one point that out because people just think carbs means breads and pastas only, and it's not, it's not just that. So currently, one in three Americans has prediabetes. And of that group, of that 33%, 84% of them don't even know they have it. It has not been diagnosed. Uh, even worse, child, childhood obesity is just skyrocketing, and it has been since the 80s. And so one of the things I, I hear often is, well, I can't afford to buy you know, high-quality fruits and vegetables or go to farmer's markets. This is where I like to bring up this number, that the average cost of care for someone who is diabetic is nearly 17000 which is two to three times more than the average person. So it's, you know, wh where do you want to pay? You want to pay more and be sick, or do you want to pay a little bit less and be healthy? Now we'll move on to some of the complications from diabetes. So, so first of all, insulin resistance causes the majority of the issues that we deal with as Americans. In fact, there's a great book called Why We Get Sick by Benjamin Bickman, that's B-I-K-M-A-N, and he really sp spells out, all the things that insulin resistance does to us. But I just picked out some that uh, physical therapists will tend to see and have, have some clinical implications. So first up is high blood pressure, hypertension. So insulin, when it's behaving normally, uh, suppresses inflammatory markers in the bloodstream. And it also stimulates nitric oxi oxide production, which is a vasodilator. So uh, if insulin is no longer doing its job, or I should say the cells are no longer responding to insulin, it has a opposite effect. So if you picture a hose, it's kind of getting shrunk from the inside out because it, those inflammatory markers are allowed to stay there and fester. And then you also get like constriction of that tube because of the lack of nitric oxide production. So it's like a double squeeze, and that's what causes high blood pressure. 
Now, obesity, so I think a lot of people think that obesity causes diabetes. I kind of see it as the other, other way around. It is a bit of a two-way two -way street because once you are obese, it does create a lot of inflammation in the gut. Uh, but generally, the, it's, it's the insulin resistance is what causes it because then your pancreas has to secrete more insulin to deal with any sugars in the blood. And as I stated earlier, insulin is an anabolic and can help build fat. It's a little more complicated than that. There's other hormones involved too, like leptin. Um, but that's the general principle. I mean, we basically want to stay insulin sensitive. So salt is often blamed for high blood pressure, and it's not quite accurate. So it's really sugar is the issue, and salt kind of takes the blame. Salt is sort of the fall guy. So aldosterone, first of all, your kidneys are always balancing your water to electrolytes, which are your waters and salts. Aldosterone is a hormone that communicates with the kidneys and tells it to hold on to salt. And when you become insulin resistant, that increases aldosterone production. So really, the sugar is, is the, the main issue. That's the one that causes fluid retention in the first place. Okay, lastly, Alzheimer's, or what's called type 3 diabetes. Have you heard that? That's a term now. Uh, so high levels of insulin cause the nerves to release an amyloid beta protein. That's the one that's implicated in Alzheimer's. So Hipp Hippocrates famously said that all disease begins in the gut, and that's another just perfect example right there. Okay, so now for some orthopedic considerations here. So arthritis, okay, this is kind of a fun one to me. Uh, the wear and tear model, I, I call it sad and poor, not wear and tear. Sad as in standard American diet and poor mechanics as opposed to your classic, you know, that you're just beating up your joints. Um, it, it goes against a lot of the principles of physiology that we know. Um, there is Wolf's Law that a body will respond to the stimulus put into it or not put into it, right? This is why astronauts come back from space with osteoporosis. And this is why runners have more cartilage in their knees than, than uh, sedentary folks. We know that a just a 10% decrease in body weight will reduce uh, the breakdown of cartilage. And, you know, you could maybe make the argument that has to do with less compression on the joints. Uh, but I think it has more to do with the inflammatory effects of something like diabetes and, and fat cells that do uh, increase, like cytokines. Uh, also, we know that diabetics with high glucose concentrations are at risk for early onset arthritis. And the other thing, too, is that sugar is sticky, which is the process of glycation. It sticks to proteins. Um, and sticks to the proteins in the cellular matrix of collagen in the cartilage and helps accelerate degeneration. So for muscle, uh, the tone of the muscle is dictated by your nervous system. So, you know, we hear this a lot as physical therapists. I hold all my stress in my neck. It's like, well, you're stressed, so your muscle tone is upregulated, basically. So the, you have two sides of your autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. And it's not like you're either one or, or, or the other. There's a gradient to it. Um, so if you are in a sympathetic state, literally your nervous system will increase the muscular stiffness to prepare you to either run or get into a fight. And the sad reality is that most of us are chronically in a sympathetic state. I learned this when um, I wore a continuous glucose monitor for a month. And it's a good proxy to tell you what state of mind you're in. Because when you are, your sympathetic nervous system is activated, uh, cortisol, the stress hormone, is released, which basically liberates the glucose from the muscle glycogen and liver to get it into your bloodstream because it, it is a great fuel source to prepare you for fight or flight. So if you, watch, if you wear a CGM, you can see in real time what your blood glucose concentration is. So if it's high, you know you're in a sympathetic state, especially if you haven't had a meal. So I, I noticed that every single time I drove, my blood sugar would be near diabetic range. Um, and part of that's gaze related too. So your gaze is tied to your nervous system. So when you have a fixed or concentrated look, you're more of a sympathetic state as opposed to using your peripheral vision. So picture like looking at a horizon or the beach or something like that. That's really relaxing. That stimulates the parasympathetic system. So some of these things are just meant to be this way, but the truth is that our, our modern lifestyles are very sympathetic. Even just like looking at a phone at night is you're in a sympathetic state. That's why it's hard to f fall asleep, not to mention the blue light. So if, if you're in a sympathetic state and you're dealing with some muscle pain, it's going to be really hard. It's kind of like fighting against a current. Um, 
And I think that's the main reason uh, massage works, by the way. It's you're just accessing your parasympathetic state, allowing the muscle tone to calm down. It's not breaking up scar tissue or something like that. Okay, next up we have measurements. Uh, so let's move on to recognizing some signs and symptoms. So a couple of these I didn't know until I started diving into this research. Skin tags, which is just a protrusion of skin, tends to be around the neck or armpits. That's a sign of prediabetes developing. Or this one, acanthosis nigricans. Uh, you've probably seen this on some, generally on more obese patients. They're going to have a thickening and a darkening of the skin, particularly in the neck, armpit, and groin. Uh, obesity, obviously, uh, we've talked about that one already. In hypertension, in fact, Benjamin Bickman says if you have central obesity and you have high blood pressure, you, by definition, have at least prediabetes. Okay, so let's get into some of the tests and measures. So one test that uh, anybody can kind of do to themselves, and physical therapists, we can administer this as well, is a glucometer. So a glucometer is, looks like that little icon in the, the blue slide there. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a finger prick test. As a therapist, if you're going to administer, administer this, you have to sign a CLIA waiver first. That's C-L-I-A, CLIA waiver. All right, these can be purchased online, uh, Amazon, uh, most pharmacies, Walmart. Walmart has one called Rely on Prime that's cheap. I think it's like 15 or $10. Um, and you're looking for uh, a fasted glucose that ranges between 70 and 100. It depends on the lab and depends on if you're talking about traditional um, lab values or if you're talking about functional medicine values. Uh, and then a postprandial, so after a meal, glucose should be under 140. Uh, that, that's considered normal. Once you go above 40, it's prediabetes and then into diabetes. Um, so these are really easy to do. If you can give a patient or instruct a patient to have a food log and they can track their one and two hour response to a meal using the glucometer. Some other tests, there is an OGTT, that's an oral glucose tolerance test. That's where they drink a solution of, I believe it's uh, 75 grams of something syrupy, sugary, and they will look at how their blood uh, sugar responds. If you do have diabetes, that can be kind of a pretty nasty test to take. Glycomark, uh, the idea here, so A1C, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, A1C is a standard blood test um, that looks at the average of blood sugar, uh, the amount of sugar that's been glycated to red blood cells. So you get a three-month average from that test. But the, the idea with the glycomark is that you don't see excursions with an A1C test, whereas a glycomark will be able to see the, 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 the big swings in blood sugar. A CGM, that's what I usually recommend to my patients, one of my favorite tools. That's a conti continuous glucose monitor. Those are the ones that look like a little disc that you wear on your tricep. Uh, you can wear it for a month or more, and uh, many of these companies will have an app that comes with it that gives you real-time data about how your blood sugar responds to food. And you get great insights to it, too. You can see how exercise, stress, sleep, all these things, how they affect your blood sugar. And then lastly, uh, what I think is a very valuable tool, and I think as physical therapists, we should have a, a bigger, greater understanding of blood work. Uh, we'll dive into that now. But first, let's do a quick review of how insulin and blood sugar work. When you eat some food with some carbs in it, uh, sugar is in your bloodstream, and then your pancreas recognizes that. And then it pushes insulin <clears throat> into the bloodstream to usher the glucose into your liver and into your muscles, mostly into the muscles. Um, that can be impaired over time, especially as we age. Uh, and you can even get what's called beta cell death. So the beta cells are in the pancreas, and those are the ones that secrete the insulin. So over time, if you kind of ignore being pre-diabetic or becoming diabetic, those beta cells stop produ producing as much insulin, and then you have to become insulin dependent. So it's irreversible at that point. But if you catch it early, you can do something about it. So that's what I want to go over. So uh, I'm just going to sort of list the primary and secondary markers that you'd get on a, a you know, if you had like an in-depth blood panel. Um, you got glucose. Um, so I'm going to talk about too high or low, what pattern we're looking for for things to be out of whack. So glucose would be high. Hemoglobin A1C or HA1C would be high. Fructosamine high. Post-meal glucose high. 
triglycerides and LDL high and HDL low. So, uh, so your cholesterol does play into your metabolic profile. It's really important to know. And then some secondary uh, hyperglycemia markers would be uric acid, which would be high, a fasting insulin high. And then your liver enzymes are all could be high. So that'd be ALT, AST, GGT, and LDH. So those would all be high. So basically all of them besides HDL would be high, whereas HDL is inverse marker would be low. So <clears throat> let me talk a little about glucose. So um, you see the, the lab ranges can go up to 94, 97, depending on the lab. Functional medicine will tighten that window to kind of catch things before it happens. So functional range in the course I'm taking is 75 to 85. Um, it is the least sensitive marker for blood sugar dysregulation. And that's unfortunate because it's kind of the standard one that's used. So, it, uh, you know, glucose basically only tells us about how blood sugar is in a fasted state. Um, and also to keep in mind that stress, lack of sleep, uh, certain drugs, these can all, all alter your glucose. Um, so you can get a lot of bad reads. <clears throat> so uh, let me go into a little more depth on that insulin uh, release that I was talking about. There's actually two phases. So when you first eat something, uh, when things are working right, you have a first phase response, and that should return your glucose under 100. And if it doesn't, the pancreas kind of pauses, and then 10 to 20 minutes later, there's a second pulse of insulin that's released, um, and that should return below 100 in a normal person. When that whole process is impaired, usually it's that second phase response that, that worsens, and that can take up to four to five hours to restore your blood sugar down to normal. So if you are pre-diabetic and this is happening to you, uh, during the day, you may never have normal glucose because of meal timing, especially if you snack a lot or you're doing the six uh, meals a day type of thing. So the only time that your glucose might be normal is in fasted states or such as like first thing in the morning. So because that can lead to a lot of false positives, it, it does go out of whack at a certain point. So it's a decent rule in test, but a pretty poor rule out test. And uh, there was a study actually in China where they found uh, patients with dementia because there's a correlation between dementia and blood sugar dysre dysregulation. In fact, type 3 diabetes is basically from glucose dysregulation. They found that in the study, uh, over 80% of the patients with dementia had fasting glucose over 90. So that's still in the you know the lab range normal. Um, that's in the higher end, but still considered normal. Um, so that just kind of opens your eyes to, okay, when well, some of these markers, maybe our ranges aren't quite right. Okay, hemoglobin A1C. So the functional range, 4.6% to 5.3%. So what that is, uh, so sugar is sticky and it sticks to your blood cells. It sticks to the hemoglobin molecule in particular. So that's called glycation. Um, so red blood cells live an average of about 90 days. So this is where there's a strength. There's some weaknesses too. Day 1C, it's really a measure of a, it's like a three-month average, basically, because those 90 days. So it's got that five, say you're 5.3%, 5.3% of your red blood cells have been glycated or have sugar stuck to them. So it's a little better than glucose because glucose is kind of just a snapshot. However, um, there is variability in blood cell lifespan. So some healthy individuals, their, their blood cells can live for over 146 days. Whereas diabetics, their blood cells lifespan can be like 81 days. So what that means is that A1C can be low in diabetics and vice versa. All right. So that kind of clouds the whole thing. This is There is another marker that I didn't mention yet called MCV, which means mean corpuscular volume. And this can be used to kind of tease out the A1C issue. So what that is, is you have, there's variance in your blood cell sizes, right? So they're born big and die small, kind of opposite humans, right? Um, so in other words, a high MCV <clears throat> can mean short-lived blood cells and a low MCV can mean long-lived blood cells. So if your A1C is high and MCV is low, it could mean that A1C is high due to long-lived red blood cells. So it's an inverse marker. So that can help tease out any issues with your A1C. Now fructose means another marker. Um, so when this goes out whack, it's high. It's another average marker for blood sugar. So you have proteins that float in your, your bloodstream, such as globulin, sorry, albumin. And, you know, th those get glycated by sugar too. But these proteins only live for about 14 to 21 days. So it's really a measure of blood sugar 
control over two weeks rather than three months. It's a cheap uh, test. It's precise. You don't see it often, but it's a good one to get. Uh, probably more accurate than A1C, and it's probably free of interference from some of the, the blood disorders like anemia that can affect A1C. The only problem, though, is it hasn't been standardized yet. And then the most sensitive marker for blood sugar dysregulation is post-meal glucose, if that's high. There's a number of ways that uh, measure this, and this is the best way to find out you know, where you stand. Okay, let's move on to management of diabetes. So what do you do in an emergency situation when someone's having an event? So we'll start off with hyperglycemia. So some of the symptoms of hyperglycemia are going to be dry mouth, thirst, weakness, headache, uh, blurred vision, and frequent urination. And this is usually if their blood glucose is greater than 250. Um, and this is also known as DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. So they should go to the hospital. And they'll be given uh, fluids and insulin. If they have insulin on them, it should be administered. Symptoms of hypoglycemia include sweating, pallor, irritability, hunger, lack of coordination, and sleepiness. And this is uh, when their blood glucose can drop below 70. Uh, this could happen in a fasted state. They could have reactive hypoglycemia when they've had a meal and they suddenly crash after that. That's reactive hypoglycemia. So for them, uh, you know, the risk is a diabetic coma. So you want to give them something sugary. So uh, food or drink of 15 to 20 grams of a fast acting carb. Uh, that could be like orange juice, uh, some sort of gel or fruit, uh, fruit juice, um, honey, sugar. Don't, if you give them soda, that's okay. Just don't give them a diet soda because you want them to have the sugar in that event. Uh, so that's what you do in an emergency situation. So what about some diet and lifestyle uh, changes you can do? Well, the first thing is you want to recommend more protein. First of all, <clears throat> most people are protein deficient, unfortunately. Uh, but protein, and particularly if you do it for breakfast, has a stabilizing effect on your blood sugar. So you want about 25 to 30% of your calories, of your, your daily calories from protein. And a general rule of thumb is one gram of protein uh, protein per pound of goal body weight. Now, that's kind of a lot. So I'd say at a, a minimum, 0.7 grams. That's what the literature says. But, I, I, you know, if you can shoot to one gram, that's going to be better. And um, it really depends on their goals. Another one is to eat more fermented foods and fibers. So poor gut health, it can contribute to poor metabolic health. And resistant starch is particularly useful for improving insulin sensitivity. All right. Uh, nothing is altering your food intake timing. So something like fasting uh, will force your body to sort of soak up and use all the carbs in the system and then run the backup generator, meaning you start to use uh, lipids and fats for, for energy. And this also has the advantage of improving your insulin sensitivity. So a good idea to not always be spiking insulin. Physical activity, this is an obvious one for us as physical therapists. It's got a number of beneficial effects on blood sugar, um, improves insulin sensitivity, and it also, when you use your muscles, it's like a sponge. It pulls sugar into the muscle, so you can literally soak up some of those blood sugars. We've all heard the 10,000 steps a day thing. I mean, with a lot of my patients that are diabetic, they're, you know, lucky if they're doing 3,000 steps. So obviously progress um, as tolerate. So if they're doing three, maybe 3,000 and shoot for 4,000 steps and just progress from there. Uh, you want about 150 minutes at least a week of moderate activity and 75 minutes per week of vigorous activity. Okay, sleep is a big one. Uh, Seven, eight hours is the general rule. That's going to vary a lot for some people. Some people are uh, biurnal sleepers, so some people do like do better with a nap in the afternoon. But, um, you know, if you ever want to wear a CGM, you'll see this. If you do like five or four hours of sleep, your blood sugar is going to be very elevated that next day. It basically puts you in a pre-diabetic state. Um, some rules with this, you want to keep it cool. Uh, keep the bedroom 68 degrees or lower and avoid blue light. Blue light kind of resets your circadian rhythm and throws sleep off dramatically. There's a great TED Talk by uh, Matt Walker. He's a neuroscientist who studies sleep and its impacts on health 
And one of the things he mentions is fascinating is that um, in the spring when we change our clocks and lose an hour of sleep, there is a 24% increase in heart attacks that following day. And conversely, in the fall when we gain an hour, we see a 21% decrease in heart attacks that next day. So pretty important stuff here. Okay, lastly, we have stress management. This is uh, kind of an easier said than done type of thing. Uh, stress is a big factor in Western society. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, when you're in the sympathetic state, cortisol is released. That increases your blood sugar. And how many of us are in a chronic sympathetic state? So I always tell my patients to seek parasympathetic activity. And there's a lot of ways to do this. So meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, deep breathing. I'm a huge fan of breath work. Breath work is so powerful. And the amount of people that uh, breathe sort of paradoxically um, is, is like an epidemic. So that, that to me is an easy one because if you think about how many breaths you take a day, it's, uh, it's a big return on investment and it's, it's free. So I just want to touch on this again, the impacts of exercise, right? So, um, so there's kind of three, three ways we can use exercise to uh, reduce blood sugar. Uh, first off is if you're doing something like HIIT training, something more vigorous, your body's going to prioritize carb consumption, carb usage. Whereas if you do like steady state or something slower, you're burning more fats for energy. Secondly, it's important to note that there are two pathways where uh, sugar leaves the bloodstream and goes into the muscle and liver. One is the insulin pathway, and then there's also the non-insulin mediated pathway. So this is what I was talking about on the previous slide, that when you use your muscles, it, it just draws sugar from the bloodstream into the muscles. And lastly, we have fasting cardio. I already touched on that before as well. Uh, but I will just point out that um, although it's a useful tool to use, it should be used sporadically. That is a form of stress in the body. I, you know, I see a lot of people doing fasted cardio every day, and, and that can be really tough to recover from. So use it you know, maybe once a week, once a month, depends on the condition of the client. Uh, the, the advantage there is that so many of us get used to burning basically carbs for energy all the time. And we become inflexible. We kind of forget how our bodies forget how to use fats. So it's kind of good to be able to go back and forth from carbs to fats. So it's a, it's a good kind of assessment and a strategy to improve metabolic flexibility. Okay, uh, that's it. That's the end of this presentation. I do want to reiterate that I really believe that physical therapists should be at the forefront of this diabetes epidemic. We have the time. We have the skills and the knowledge. Uh, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I've also got a bunch of references here on the slides, and I will put those in the notes.